just as I asked at the outset of our conversation what it was that got you interested in plasma and nuclear physics, what was it that captured your interest in the relationship between science and religion? My understanding is that you you were, you became religious in college, so maybe maybe that's where we should start. Yeah, um, I first of all, I am a Christian. Uh, I believe that Jesus uh, is the Son of God and rose from the dead on the third day, and so I'm, I'm basically pretty orthodox in my uh, Christian theology and outlook. And I think that's just who I am. I wasn't always a Christian. Uh, I grew up as in, in a family which is not Christian. It, it was my, my, my family didn't go to church. My, my parents, you know, were, well, certainly my mother was an atheist and my father never went to church. Um, and uh, broadly speaking, uh, that was where I stood. I, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't ignorant of Christianity because I went to a school where where it was nom- it had nominal Christian roots, but I was not drawn to it and I didn't believe it. And so, even though you know prayers might sometimes have been said, I you know I just I didn't pay much attention to it. I'm, I was an anti-Christian, but I just didn't believe it. Um, I became a Christian when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge University in in the United Kingdom. Um, for reasons that probably I shouldn't go into detail about. But basically, I mean, the bottom line was I became convinced that the evidence for uh, the resurrection of Jesus and the, and, the, and the evidence for the truth of Christianity uh, as a whole was very powerful um, and very uh, convincing and that I was drawn to it in part because I had friends who – who had attractive lives that that um, were Christians, but also because um, the the commitment to truth and to faith and to uh, loyalty and many other properties I saw as being part of a Christian inheritance. So um, you know that's that's a very long you know very long story. If 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 you're if your um, listeners are really interested to know more details about the story, they could read my book, uh, Can a Scientist Believe in Miracles, in which I, you know, I write down in more detail my journey to faith. Um, but I have been a Christian since I was just before I was 20 years old. Uh, I won't tell you how old I am now, but it's a, long, it's a lot more than that. Um, and, I, and so if that makes me you know, a profoundly religious person, yes, um, I am. I am a a Christian believer. I go to church and I pray and I read the Bible and so forth. Okay. Well, I hope that you didn't think I was using the word profoundly in any pejorative sense. No, no. I I, I take no offense uh, (laughs) whatsoever. uh, But but I do think that that there is a certain, I don't know, uh, caricature of, um, of religious people which seems to imply that they're somehow peculiar, and um, and I yeah I may be peculiar in lots of ways, and my my Christian faith might be one of my peculiarities. I have many others, I'm sure, um, but um, but I but I prefer to um, think of myself as a thoughtful uh, person throughout all of the assessments of the world that I make, my scientific and my and my social and my and my religious commitments, um, and so I don't think I probably quite fit the caricature. Sure. Well, I am absolutely not interested in portraying you as a caricature on any level, so we don't have to worry about that. But I I will certainly in the introduction reiterate what I'll say right now, which is that anybody who is interested should absolutely read your book. But if it's okay with you, I would like to ask a few questions about the things that you just alighted that are in the book. And so the truth of Christianity, I think, is a great place to begin uh, before we bring science explicitly into the picture. So maybe you could explain just briefly what sorts of considerations took you from someone who did not believe in God to someone who believed in the truth of Christianity. And maybe before you begin, more particularly, what it was that led you to believe in this particular God rather than, say, 
the multiple gods of the Hindu religion or the god of Judaism, who, though I suppose is, I mean, numerically identical to the god of Catholicism, is believed to have very different properties in so much as he is, on your view, the the father of Jesus Christ who rose on the third day. But that is not how the how Jewish people would characterize him. Sure. Or her or... Okay, well... <laughs> I think you have several questions there. One of them was, you know, why do I, why am I a Christian? You know, yeah. I think you're asking a, in a certain sense an intellectual question. How do I, how do I intellectually um, come to or, or, or feel comfortable about um, the Christian faith? I, I, you know, I would say um, that I approach my faith uh, in a in an intellectual way, in a certain sense. I, I don't mean an overly intellectual way. I, I just think that you know the plausibility of the Christian faith is great, and the uniqueness of the Christian faith is that um, you know is the person it lies it within the person of Jesus Christ, and I think. Jesus is an extremely attractive figure from the point of view of his teachings of his life and so forth. He represents um, a a powerful model and um, uh, an embodiment of truth and justice and 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 love and and all sorts of things which I personally think are very valuable. He. I mean, obviously, in the West, he, the, the person of Jesus and the, of the Christian and the, and the Christian faith in general, dominated our society and, and was, in many respects, you know, the the birthplace of of modern civilization. I don't mean to denigrate, you know, India or or China, where where that, which have their own civilizations, but the civilization that now powerfully influences the world lies there. But in the end, um, the, the most pow- most per- persuasive thing to me was, I, th- as I read the Gospels, I felt um, there was a, a great truth in them. I think I wasn't unaware of the, you know, let's say critical theories and, and discussions c- concerning, um, you know, wh- how trustworthy those Gospels might be. But I think that there's a very good argument which says, how did those early disciples, um, how were they transformed from a beaten um, group of radicals whose, whose leader had been crucified by the Romans into um, people who were excited to go out and spread the story, at any rate, that Jesus was not dead, that he had risen from the dead. Um, and I think that if you try to explain how that took place, um, that it's very hard to do so um, if you don't take seriously the idea that maybe he really did die, rise from the dead. At any rate, um, probably, again, you could read the book for the more detailed arguments, but that's the outline of where the arguments go. Okay. Interesting. And I, I know one way in which I might push back and with regard to what you just said about the disciples going from being beaten down to excited, we can also imagine that similar things have happened where people have been uh, beaten down but uplifted by a messianic messianic type figure in other religions. And there presumably since these figures aren't captured in the bible you wouldn't feel the need to ascribe or some sort of holy component to what is going on here well yeah you're implying that christianity isn't unique in its claims but i would dispute that uh i mean i i think the claim of the resurrection of jesus is basically unique it's not it's not true that no one ever talked about people dying and rising again of course they did and in fact lots of primitive nature religions you know have 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 
the idea of nature dying in the winter and coming back to life in the spring and and you know talk about life and death and and a cycle of of uh, of lives but i think the claim that it actually happened to this one person whom the people were testifying about i think that is a unique situation uh and and that you know the um discussions of um, resurrection uh, gods that, that are, are discussed in, in actually in many cases in contemporary religions, contemporary to early Christianity, first century religions, um, actually uh, insofar as their actual claims of resurrection um, are, are much different from Christians, Christianity, except in those cases where they're actually borrowing from Christianity. So so I think that you know the scholarship would say, uh, yeah, there are some uniquenesses about Christianity, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm comfortable with, if you like, the the very particular claims of Christianity. Coming back to what you said about about other gods, I mean, it's not the case. I think that um, Christians take the view that our God is very different from the Jewish God. Um, uh, I think that it, it, actually it's the same. Um, it's just that you know Jewish people don't uh, regard Jesus Christ as being divine and and part of part of the Godhead. So it's so it's a, of course it's a different religion, but it's but there are lots of similarities. Uh, in particular, you know that it is a monotheistic religion, trinitarian but monotheistic at the same time. A puzzle, yes, I know, um, uh, and and in that sense, you know, uh, the, I think that monotheism makes much more intellectual sense of who and what the Godhead might be than do you know pantheistic or polytheistic religions. Um, you know, the polytheistic religions of the Greeks and Romans were in many respects relatively implausible um, projections of human society onto onto the Godhead in a way that I don't think that is true of monotheism. Hmm. Well, in response to your first point, I don't know I don't think I'm really disputing the uniqueness of the resurrection, but I think what's significant here is that you take historical and other considerations to heart that you find sufficient to merit your belief in the factual character of the resurrection, and that's what's important. That's and I'm that's what's important. And so there are so there, yeah, are, there yeah, you know I'm not too sure what I that I would say sufficient, but but it's certainly very strong evidence. Okay, I do think that. <laughs> That if you start from a position which says that you know there can't be a god and it makes no sense, I know that there aren't gods, then I don't think you are going to find the historical evidence sufficient to persuade to persuade you. Uh, but if you start from a position which is a perfectly respectable philosophical position that asks the question, well, where did it all come from? And is there something? Is there something that must exist? Uh, and is that thing that or that that entity that must exist personal or simply uh, abstract? Then I think that y you may well start from a place, and and many people do start from the place from a place where they say, well, yeah, maybe there is a god. Um, and uh, I wonder what he's like, or he it or she, for that matter, is like, okay? Um, and if you start from a place like that, then I think the historical evidence is something that makes sense to look at very seriously and and take seriously. Um, so I don't feel as though I can persuade someone who already thinks they know that they can't be a god by, by saying, look at the historical evidence. But I do think that if people were to read the Gospels, you know, with an open mind, uh, they might find they were a lot more persuasive than they think they are. I mean, many people in our modern society think they know what the Bible says, but they don't um, because they never read it. 
Um, so you know, that's that. So maybe not sufficient, but but persuasive, nevertheless. 